my Govanen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek, and in this video, I am finally going to get around to reviewing the BBC production of The Lord of the Rings. This is a radio drama that was done many years ago, uh, and one of the more interesting things about it is the fact that Ian Holm, who played Bilbo in the Peter Jackson trilogy, plays Frodo in this particular adaptation. So it's kind of interesting how that works out. Some of the other voice actors are also, you know, famous for other roles in and out of the Lord of the Rings universe. But I want to go ahead and get into what I like about it, what I don't like about it, and my overall thoughts. So let's go ahead and do it. So the one big kind of thing that they do with this that is really interesting is the way that they handle audio cues. Generally, they do a pretty good job of audio cues, but sometimes they don't really add enough in to really give you a good sense of what's going on. And there are several points where this or something related to it happens, and I'm not always sure what exactly the problem is, if they're just kind of changing the story or if they're just being bad with the audio cues. But one example of this is Gandalf's fight with the Balrog. You really have no idea what's going on. There's things happening, but there's not enough contextual information to really make a whole lot of sense of it. Another one is when Frodo and Gollum are fighting at the Crack of Doom. You can hear Gollum kind of monologuing, but it's not a very natural kind of I'm wrestling with Frodo type of monologue, and so it's just kind of weird. You're not really sure what's going on. That said, there's you know a good number of places where the audio cues are pretty good, and that's you know useful because this is not and and by point of comparison, I grew up listening to the NPR version when I was much younger, and it's much more, it, it's less of a radio dramatization and almost more of a dramatized reading, because the narrator actually does a lot of the narration that would be in the book, as opposed to just having everything be the actors playing their roles. So in the NPR version, you would actually get, you know, narrative that's not spoken dialogue a lot, whereas in the BBC version, you don't really get much of that at all. And so you have to have these audio cues. And most of the time, like I said, they do pretty good. But there are those instances, but there are some pretty serious ones too. An example of one where I'm not exactly sure what the problem is, is when Frodo reads the letter that Gandalf left for Butterbur to send on to him, which Butterbur failed to send on to him. And Frodo reads it, and it seems from the context that we have that he actually just reads it out loud in front of Strider, which is kind of, that doesn't really work because one of the points of it in the story is that Frodo reads the verse about not all who wander are lost and he reads it quietly to himself. And then when Aragorn later uses lines from that same poem, he recognizes that there's a link there. Whereas if he read it out loud, in front of Strider, how is any of this a proof of who Strider actually is? That doesn't really work. Another one would be when the Rohirrim arrive at Minas Tirith. Again, this is this may be more of a decision of how they just wanted to run with it, but they kind of did a... It's like they made it one big long thing where the Rohirrim arrive and they just kind of push through without any speech by Theoden. It's like they're kind of working around the fact that they're not doing audio cues or narration. And so they kind of get the Rohirrim there, and then they interweave the song, which it tells us in the book, is written afterward about Theoden's ride. And they kind of sing that, and it's like it's carrying the narrative forward without actually being just a narration. And then it gets really weird, though, when we get to the Witch King, because when the Witch King faces off, against Theoden, like some of his lines are said as if he's talking to Theoden, which should have been against Eowyn, and there's just some weird stuff that goes on there, and then Mary doesn't even seem to play a role in any of the Witch King standoff, so he seems to be completely unaffected by Mary, who's, I mean, it's just, the way it plays out is weird, and it, you can tell probably that some of that is a lack of narration and they're like how do we get around this fact that we don't want to 
narrate what Mary is doing. You know, they don't, I guess they didn't want to have him like talking to himself or whatever, which, you know, the NPR version kind of did some of that where they couldn't really narrate it very well. They sometimes just had a, one of the characters kind of think to themselves. So you kind of follow along what's, what's happening here. They don't really do much of that. And so the way it plays out here is just kind of strange. On the topic of songs, though, one of the other interesting things about this particular adaptation is the way in which it does some things with high fidelity to the source material in some ways in which it doesn't, and then some that are kind of mixed categories there. Uh, and one of the ways that it does high fidelity is the fact that a lot of the songs in the book are actually sung in the the course of the radio dramas. And one of the interesting things about this actually, Boromir's dream, the one that Faramir and Boromir had, which led Boromir to come to Rivendell, in which he repeats at the Council of Elrond, is done as a song, which I can't really imagine Boromir singing it as a song at the Council of Elrond. And I'm not sure there's really any indication that it was sung in the dream even, but here they do it as a song. They basically treat it as a song because it's poetry, I guess. But there are others, too. I mean, like Hobbit walking songs and things like that, and that's nice. But then there's other cases where, of course, they don't really pay as much, you know, well, they don't stick to the, the source material as much. And, I mean, there's some of this you're, you kind of have to expect. Of course, they leave out Tom Bombadil. They also leave out Baragond in Minas Tirith. They leave out a lot of things, you know, that you would tend to expect an adaptation to leave out. And this is one of those areas where I really like the NPR version because they were very high fidelity. They kept almost everything. They changed very little. Um, but in here, of course, we leave out a lot of things that would make it a little more slow down the narrative or that sort of thing. And, of course, they were working within kind of a tighter, tighter limit of what they could do because they had to do it in a certain number of episodes of certain length. One of the interesting ways in which they kind of do a blending of being you know, having fidelity to the source material, but also not really sticking to the text, is the way in which they blend in things that aren't strictly from the Lord of the Rings, but they might be from, say, the Unfinished Tales, like The Hunt for the Ring. I've done a video on The Hunt for the Ring, and I'll link to that in the description below, but it's basically an account of what were the Nazgul and other people doing, you know, during all this. You know, we get references to Worm Tongue, we get references to the person who ends up being the squint-eyed southerner who shows up at the Prancing Pony Inn in Bree. They weave all this kind of stuff into the narrative, and they do several other things like this. For example, they actually play out a scenario of what it might have been like for Gollum to be captured in the, in the, around the borders of Mordor. That we never actually get in the Unfinished Tales, but of course it had to have happened, and so they just kind of imagine what that might have been like and add it in. Some of the stranger decisions, though, are when they cut out stuff or cut them way down in ways that are just kind of bizarre. For example, the chase of Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli chasing down the Urukai who have taken Merry and Pippin, that gets cut really short. So does Aragorn's conversation with Eomer. They cut a lot of that out. And, you know, a lot of it's not really necessary to the plot you know, per se, but, it, you know, they, they cut it way, way down. And considering that they took the time to add in, you know, walking songs and things like that, it seems kind of like a weird choice. Two others where they do the same kind of thing is in the, the scene where the hobbits first meet Faramir, Frodo and Sam. In the book, of course, when they meet him, it's just right before the rangers of Athelion ambush a bunch of Easterlings or Southerns, I forget which, which are marching to Mordor. I think it's Southerns, actually. But the battle here doesn't happen in the BBC version. They just skip right over that. Faramir finds him, and then he goes right into his conversation with Frodo, where he's kind of probing him about, you know, why he's there. And then again, at the end of the story, where we have the scouring of the Shire, and if you're not familiar with that episode, I can link to that in the description below as well. I've done a video on that. There, they skip from you know, basically the hobbits arriving back in the Shire straight to Hobbiton. They don't have kind of any of the in-between stuff, which is, to me, kind of sad, because if you're going to do the scouring of the Shire, it's actually really important that you get all that middle stuff in there, because a lot of the middle stuff shows you just how bad things have gotten and how, you know, the hobbits who lived there and kind of succumbed to the, the new regime, so to speak, it shows you that even hobbits can 
you know, end up being kind of bad characters under the right circumstances. And I think that was kind of important. So again, given the fact that they included certain other things, I thought it was a little weird that they cut some of that short. On the flip side, the production quality in this version is pretty darn good. I mean, it is the BBC. I will say that the voice acting as a general rule is significantly better than the NPR version. The NPR version has some voice actors that pretty clearly are, you know, acting outside their normal vocal range. It seems like they're trying to be too high or too low or, you know, and they don't all, you know, they seem to be kind of putting on voices, so to speak. They're not just giving their own voice, which pretty much everybody in here is. I mean, Michael Holdern, excuse me, Holdern or Hoarder? Mm, I don't remember his name for some reason. His last name is either Hoardern or Holdern. British actor, very good actor who plays Gandalf in the BBC version, just sounds like himself. And so does Ian Holm and basically everybody else. There are some exceptions to this, which I'll get to a little later on. But by and large, you know, they're all just voice actors doing voice acting. They're not putting on voice personas so much. But one of the uh, other things about the production quality is every now and then you do come across a voice actor in here that's not, not that great. Bilbo's voice actor to me was not super. Faramir's was not very good at conveying emotion, uh, so there there are some you know some drop you know some fallouts there that just don't quite meet the standard of the rest of them. Also, similar to this, the sometimes the dialogue itself just kind of gets cut short in a weird way that doesn't it doesn't really flow right, and it just leaves you kind of wondering what just happened there. Another one, and to be fair, this is one that you could apply to pretty much any adaptation, but this one I think is one of the worst offenders, is the cry of the Nazgul that the hobbits repeatedly hear in the Shire and will later hear, you know, in other places. The one that they do in the BBC version is just, to me, not very good at all. Now, like I said, you could say that about practically any of them. Peter Jackson's does a decent one. But even there, it's like they're, it's scary, but it, I don't think it's really the same thing as what Tolkien had in mind. The one in the NPR version is not terribly good either. I mean, it's really hard to even come up with a way to do it that you might really believe. And so I can see why that failing happens a lot. But here, eh, there's the one in the BBC version just really didn't, didn't strike me as very good. Back to what I was saying earlier about there are exceptions to some of the people have, you know, kind of putting on voices. Aragorn's voice actor doesn't exactly put on voices, but he does do one interesting thing, which I thought was nice in its own way, although at first I was really weirded out by it. When you first meet Strider, he's got this really, really strong, like, Cockney-ish accent. At least I think it's Cockney. I'm not that up on my British sub-dialectic accent, so, you know, if I'm wrong, correct me uh, for any of you who have heard it, but it struck me as really bizarre, but then as he, as they leave, you know, he starts to act, talk more and more like a normal person, more or less, and I realized what they had done, because at one point there is a stage where Frodo, even in The Prancing Pony, says, your voice has changed, you know, he's, he's not putting on the Strider persona anymore, which is meant to sound more like one of the people of Bree, presumably, and he's talking more like himself, and Frodo picks up on this. And we don't really catch that as much in the book because it's all written, but they kind of put that into the way he voice acted, and I think that was pretty good. I will say, though, as far as accents generally, Gimli, to me, sounded way too much like working-class type accent and not so much like just a different kind of person accent. And this is one area where I think Peter Jackson did a pretty good job of having John Rhys Davies just adopt kind of a Scottish accent for Gimli. It's not low class per se. It's just different than a standard English accent. And it kind of meshes with what Tolkien does, you know, with his languages. You know, he's got Anglo-Saxon for you know the the native language of Rohan, which is not actually Anglo-Saxon, but he's like giving us analogs to imagine, you know, what it would be like or whatever. So it made sense to me that Gimli would have like a Scottish accent, and you could even say that dwarves generally should, which they don't in the Hobbit movies, so they kind of messed that up, but whatever. Point being, 
I think that made sense, whereas Gimli's voice actor in here, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but he just didn't sound he didn't sound dwarvish so much as just low class English working man. <laughs> so um and one other thing that I kind of noticed about the accents, Bill Nighy, who plays Sam, interestingly enough, um, his accent seems inconsistent. It doesn't seem like it's always the same. Like at some points he definitely is kind of hitting that low-class working man English, which makes sense because Sam is a servant and he's a he's a gardener. Uh, and then sometimes he just sounds more like regular old Bill Nighy, and it's like, well, you don't really sound like Samwise anymore. You just sound like Bill Nighy. Um, so there's, you know, there are downsides to that. But overall, voice acting in this one is very good. There are also some just weird miscellaneous things that I wanted to throw in here. One of them is sometimes the music they have in the background doesn't really seem to jive with what's going on in the action of the story. And, you know, just for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe it's just me, maybe it's my taste, whatever, but it's like, you know, and I, I don't remember specifically offhand what the music sounded like at this point because it's been so long since I listened to it, but you might have like kind of an action scene where the music is kind of lull and, you know, but it's just disconnects like that. Another one, like I mentioned earlier, is the fact that the song or the poem that uh, Boromir recites was done as a song, and it was just kind of done like out of the blue. Boromir's voice actor doesn't even sing it. It's actually, you know, just like some third voice comes out and sings it as if he's remembering it or something like that. I thought that was just kind of weird. Uh, so that was one of the ones that was more bizarre, but then... Also, there's some things that just seem like mistakes. Like at one point, Gandalf's character, he ends up saying something about Minas Anor, and the context in which he says it almost implies that he thinks it's a different thing than Minas Tirith. And if you're not aware, Minas Anor is what Minas Tirith was called before, you know, the you know, most of the events of the third age of the the War of the Ring. Early on in the Third Age, it was called Minas Anor, the Tower of the Sun, which echoed Minas Ithil, Tower of the Moon, which was what would become Minas Morgul. And Anarion was king, well, not king, but like co-ruler in Minas Anor, whereas Isildur was in Minas Ithil. And then that all fell apart when Sauron returned from the fall of Numenor and started waging war against him. Minas Tirith was the name it gained, it gained later on, and the name basically means Tower of Guard, and it's the idea that Sauron has returned and we're guarding against it. So it's the same exact place, but whatever Gandalf says makes you like, does he think they're two different things? That's the way it seems. Uh, so just some things that were just kind of bizarre. So overall, what do I think about this adaptation? You know, as an adaptation, it's, you know, pretty good. I mean, it's it's relatively high fidelity because it does have a lot of time to invest as a radio serial drama. You know, it, it wasn't limited like some of the older movies were. Peter Jackson getting his, you know, three and a half plus hour movie trilogy. You know, each movie is at least three and a half hours. That's, you know, outside of like the early days of Hollywood epics like Ben-Hur and things like that, and then the more you know, recent, well, I mean, even nowadays, you don't get movies that long very much. So, I mean, that was really a unique thing in the history of cinema, pretty much, for our age. So, given that, they pretty well did a lot of high-fidelity stuff, and they had pretty good voice actors for almost everybody. Aragorn's voice, act, voice actor is not my favorite. I think he, it could have been done better. It sounds like he's always kind of trying to put on airs, and I don't know if that's because of the actor or because of the way he was trying to act Aragorn. You know, I have quibbles with things like that. Like, it's also just kind of weird hearing Ian Holm as Frodo because I, I'm so used to him being Bilbo, but you kind of get over that. Uh, but as a general rule, very high quality, very well done. You know, some of the decisions that they made creatively make a lot of sense. And like I said, a lot of the a lot of the times the audio cues do come off. They have enough audio cues there that you don't need a narrator. I don't think it worked all the time, and I think they should have had more audio cues than they did in some places because you need something to kind of give you a little more context. Because sometimes, I mean, if you don't, if you really came into this without even knowing the story at all. 
there are points where you'd be wondering what just happened. I literally don't know. Um, but overall, it was really well done, really well put together. And if you got a really long car ride or anything else that you're doing where you just have time to just listen for a long period, it can definitely give you some entertainment for a good long while because it's it's hours and hours of, of listening. And of course, the music is also pretty good. It's not orchestral or anything. It's relatively small budget because it's, you know, it's a BBC radio show. It's not a grand, huge movie. So, uh, but given that, the music is pretty good for the most part, other than, like I said, sometimes it doesn't seem to connect with the action. Uh, so yeah, I mean, overall, it's a really good adaptation. I still prefer the NPR, and this is probably at least in part my bias from having heard it earlier on. But it's also my purest bias because I really, I really just like having everything that goes on, you know, in the book, you know, relayed to me as well. Because every time you, you know, skip out on something, it's just kind of disappointing. It's like, man, why couldn't they cover that? So, you know, I have my purest bias and I have my, you know, childhood listening bias. So, you know, counting those out, this is still a really good adaptation and it's definitely worth picking up if you're into that kind of thing. So that's my review of the BBC Lord of the Rings radio drama. Hope you enjoyed the review. Hope you uh, learned a few things that might help you decide whether to pick it up if you don't already have it. If you have listened to it and you have any other comments that you think I should have made about it, please do leave them in the comment section below. And you can follow me on Twitter at JRRTLore for some occasional Tolkien-related trivia questions. And of course, don't forget to like the video and share it around if you did enjoy it. Of course, if you want to subscribe to the channel, you can do that here. Don't forget to, click, forget to click that bell icon. And you can, of course, support the channel here. You can find two of my previous videos here. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek, signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namadie.